My entrepreneurial journey began actually in a neat way. I was working my way through a business degree from Thompson Rivers University actually and decided that I really wanted to go into business for myself. So a year before I graduated with my undergraduate degree, I uh, opened my very first business, which was a booster, booster Juice franchise. And that was tremendously successful. So I ended up opening a second store a year later and purchasing a third store. It was a little kiosk that existed in uh, the mall here in town. And what was neat about it is that um, it grew so quickly and the community just totally embraced it. So over the next six years, uh, we built them up to a, a pretty uh, substantial gross revenue and uh, felt like, you know, use the businesses to my very best of ability to make a difference, both to my employees and also within the community. One of the things that uh, was such a neat surprise to me with doing business was how, um, how well people responded to being authentic when you're doing business. And being that I was young and inexperienced, uh, I didn't go out trying to be something I wasn't. I just did my best to do my best in whatever way that showed up. So, for example, with my employees, I worked my way up, you know, from the very beginning with our first store was um, employed 15 people. And then with all three stores combined, uh, worked our way up to uh, being about a staff of 50. And with that massive crew, I really did my best to treat them as a team, truly, and give them you know, respect and guidance. And our staff meetings had a lot less to do with upselling or sales goals and a lot more to do with their own goals and doing my best to be a great leader to them and realizing that in my case, when I was you know, the, a franchisee of, uh, you know, it's fast food, it's uh, healthy fast food, but it's not likely that many of my employees will stay with me forever. It's a stepping stone job and I didn't want to delude myself into thinking that this was their whole world. And so in fact I just embraced the fact that I knew they had lots of other things going on in their lives. And one of my policies was that if they asked for time off, I gave it to them. And it meant that I had to staff a larger crew. It was in fact an expense that I incurred because when you're dealing with 50 staff members, trying to put together a schedule is like putting you know, a complicated puzzle together for every week. But I was willing to incur the cost, the time that goes into <clears throat> to doing that, as well as to staffing more people to cover the shifts that others uh, you know, have asked for uh, because they need time off. I was willing to incur those costs because I believed that busy people, you know, if they're in their late teens or early 20s, which was a lot of the applicants that the resumes that I saw coming through my door, if you're a leader, then you are busy in those years, pretty much whenever in your life. You know, leaders are busy, and I wanted leaders in my store. So, yes, it meant that it was more difficult to schedule, but I also believed that I attracted and retained fabulous people who were willing to go above and beyond because I was willing to give first and to help them keep balance in their lives. I would say to them, education is one of my core values. I want you to get great grades in school. So take time off to study because that's not what I had necessarily in all the jobs when I was going to school and getting my degree. So I wanted to be the opposite of you know, some of the things that I'd seen along the way. And, <clears throat> and then another Another initiative was our Acts of Kindness program where I paid every single staff member to come in and do a four-hour shift where they'd show up in their uniform and their sole responsibility for those four hours was to do random acts of kindness for neighboring businesses or um, you know, for their team members. Their job was, the only requirement was that they weren't allowed to do regular smoothie making duties. They couldn't do their regular job. They had to find creative ways to make other people's day. And that program was probably, it was one of the most fun times in running the business. And I can honestly say it was the first time I truly felt successful, even though they were 
you know, the stores were bringing in close to $2 million a year in revenue and they were, one of them was the busiest location within the franchise in British Columbia and number six across all of Canada. And there were some great numbers that were coming in, but the financial side wasn't the thing that made me feel successful. And at the end of the day, I can look back at that, you know, that program, the Acts of Kindness Challenge, and say that that was the greatest, the greatest initiative that I ever ran as an entrepreneur. In terms of personal commitment, even if we think about time in and that kind of thing, it literally, it was the thing I did. So I was um, in my mid-20s and, uh, you know, didn't basically sacrificed the second half of my 20s for this business. It was what I did. It's, I was in love with it. It was, there was no social life. There was no, nothing else. All I did from morning until late, late at night was work on my business, either being there to serve customers, to do scheduling, um, you know, first thing in the morning, being there to open the store late at night, learning about how to run my business properly. So, you know, I'd fall asleep with my financials around me every night. And at one point I was also finishing my business degree. So my homework was there as well, but it was the thing I did. And uh, it was a massive time commitment. It wasn't the kind of thing that, you know, the idea of becoming a business owner, it's uh, a lot of people are attracted to it because they think they can work less and the truth was I worked a lot more and yes there were some great payoffs for it but it came from tremendous time in. I'd say there were a few key factors in the success of uh, the business that I was involved in. One was timing within the market. There was truly a need for the product and um, the community was was willing to to spend their money on this product. So that's that's always number one. Your revenue has to be there. There has to be a market for it. Another key factor, I think, was the fact that people could buy me in the role that I was selling. So in my case, I was selling uh, you know, healthy fast food. I was selling smoothies. And I was my own target market. I had opened the business because I had identified the fact that I wished that there was something that was healthy and convenient for me. And I was the number one consumer of my own product, but they could also buy me as you know, a 20 something year old female as an expert in the world of smoothies. You know, smoothies, sure, we'll give you smoothies. You can be the expert in smoothies. So, but it's, it is all congruent. I wasn't claiming to be an expert on something that was against the grain somehow and what people would intuitively feel that I, I truly could be, I could be the expert in juice. Good, we'll give you a fruit. There's something really precious about creating an energy in your business that is unlike others. And whatever that means to you, and you know, when I was talking earlier about being authentic, what does it mean to you? What do you want, what do you want people to experience? And how are you gonna create that experience for them? And being very intentional with it. That sets you apart. There's always room in a market for businesses that are run extraordinarily well, but how are you setting yourself apart? And it has to come from um, a place within you because you're giving a lot. So it has to be, you're doing something that's calling you in some way and you're creating that experience for the customer that's based on what's calling you, what feels right to you and not just running some promotional program. It's totally, it's, uh, it's, it is the secret. That is it. That's the secret ingredient. In terms of most significant challenge that I faced, I was a student when I started this business. I didn't come from a rich family and I had to raise the money to start these businesses on my own. So in graduating from school, I had student loans. That was, that was my financial situation. And um, finding other uh, finding investors that were interested in supporting this product and service and believing in the fact that I could make it happen was you know, one of the biggest challenges to, um, to attract others who have the money and who are willing to support you in your dream, without a doubt, was one of the biggest challenges. So because I was a multi-unit franchisee, I had three different stores and each of them were incorporated. They were separate entities. With each of the three locations, I had a different 
set up with the way that I had organized the ownership structure as, as well as the way we found uh, or I found investors. So all three stores were totally unique in the, the number of investors that were involved as well as um, how they were set up. Sometimes uh, I was dealing with a small business loan from the bank. Other times I was dealing with uh, individuals who were investing or who were loaning for a return on their money. But my goal was always to under-promise and over-deliver so that no matter what, we had a healthy long-term relationship as opposed to having dealing with their disappointment if things weren't going the way that I'd hyped it up to be. Um, the other thing was I wanted to borrow smaller amounts of money from more people so that I didn't feel the pressure of having their kids education fund weighing on my you know day-to-day -day mind as I'm going through trying to build my business. So I'd rather take a little bit from a few different people versus it all riding on one person who then is constantly checking up with you and that changes the dynamic of you know what what you feel in the relationship with your investors. Because I sold my three stores, a lot of people ask, was it not what you expected it to be? And the truth of the matter is, I always, uh, I knew that this was coming. I knew that I was planning to sell. The exit strategy was always clear. And in fact, the exit strategy was clear right from day one. When I was first uh, looking for investors, we talked about selling the businesses and we actually held on to them for two years longer than we expected because they were doing so well it became so difficult to let go of them. So yes, the exit strategy was super clear and it's actually probably one of the reasons that I was able to find the investors that I did because they were, they knew that uh, that this was, you know, they knew how much, for how long, and what, where, how and why. So I was really clear about that and I think it helped me raise the funds that I needed to get started. If you're thinking about buying a franchise, if I were thinking about buying a franchise again now, the things that I'd really be clear about are uh, what does a day in the life of a franchisee look like? So I'd go out and interview someone who is, uh, is representing the franchise and the franchise tells you about them. So if, if you ask them, who could I talk to? They'll send you to their best, most um, vocal supporter. Of course they would because their their job is to sell franchises. And I would also look at the people that aren't being promoted by the franchisor. So franchisees who have been in the business for a while and I would want to try and spend some time with them asking them questions about what the biggest challenges are that they face and um, what didn't go according to plan for them with their franchisor. Um, or you know maybe it's going phenomenally well and right across the board there's nothing but positive things to say. Um, it's a, like I said, it's a unique relationship between the franchisor and the franchisee and depending on what the franchise is, like the you know day-to-day -day operations, all of these things factor into the lifestyle that you're looking for. So the key would be asking the questions that pertain to uh, how it affects your everyday life. And then, of course, there's the stuff around financials. You know, are, are the margins the way, um, you know, they are perceived to be? The franchisor has a uh, responsibility to disclose kind of average earnings. However, um, your store might not be a typical store uh, or your business operation might not be the typical business operation. So always do your best to uh, underestimate. If this is what they're selling you or they're, they're promising uh, or they're not promising, if this is what they're suggesting would be typical for you in terms of revenue and costs, always uh, you know underestimate your revenue and overestimate your costs and then see if it still makes sense for you and your situation.